Ian Stewart Durham University. So can we can I just continue uh, uh, with with constrained satisfaction? So what does it mean for constrained satisfaction? In particular, the fate of Vardy conjecture. Well, um, what has uh, come out in this work so far? I mean, there was a, there was a paper with um, Gail Gottlob and Fogon Kalaitis, as I was mentioning last year, is this refined version of constraint satisfaction. So now you can revisit constraint satisfaction with this new twist. And of course, ask, if you like, the same questions, but with this new twist. And it turns out it's quite a non-trivial twist. And now the results so far are really about um, delineating the tractability boundary between in, in for a certain class of cases. But of course, one could revisit the classification results um, and so forth in this, in this robust world. Um, the, the particular motivation for getting into that work was a very natural complexity problem arising from the kind of tables we've been talking about tonight, which is given a table, can I tell if it has a hidden, if it has a classical source, if it has a hidden variable explanation? Um, and it proved, although it's easy to see that it's in NP, it proved surprisingly hard to show that it was NP hard. I actually must admit that I set a student on this who eventually gave up and um, actually joined a database group as it happened and has been doing splendidly. <laughs> but then it took the uh, might of uh, Georg and Fokion to uh, settle the problem and there's actually some very nice results on both sides of the, of the boundary. So that's, that's what's happened so far and I think potentially this robust refinement and various other things that are suggested here um, can give, give some new, new perspectives. Of course, I'm not saying there's machinery one derives from this that settles one of the big existing conjectures. Sofia Drosopoulou, Imperial College. Um, you showed us how you went from the probabilistic uh, table to the possibilistic table. And you said that you obtained a stronger result. Um, I would have thought that there is a mapping from the probabilistic to the possibilistic table and um, the possibilistic has got uh, less information, so why is it a stronger result? Ah, very good question. Um, the point is that we're, um, if there was, if there was uh, an a classical source at the probabilistic level, it would descend via this mapping to one at the possibilistic level. But what we're showing, but on the other hand, because it's weaker, because it has less information, there could be extra possibilities for a classical source at the possibilistic level. But what we showed is that there can be no classical source at the possibilistic level. So it's actually a strictly stronger result. And this is, in fact, um, ah, I've lost my, uh, never mind. Uh, so this is the beginnings of seeing that there's a hierarchy of degrees of, non, of contextuality. Uh, and uh, so this is one of the things that comes out of, uh, so there's actually, a, there's actually three levels, um, three immediate levels that come in this way. One is where you, you have to use the full um, information from the probabilities to detect contextuality, which is actually the weakest kind. Then there's this kind we looked at. There's even a stronger kind um, where... Um, there's no instruction set that's consistent with the constraints at all, and which incidentally can be realized in quantum mechanics as well. And from having that hierarchy, we can then start to use that to classify the entangled states by the maximum degree of contextuality that they can exhibit. So this is really a, an important handle into, uh, into the whole issue. Yes, so ex excellent question. Thank you for asking it. So in the, um, the world of program verification, there's been a lot of work on, on uh, concurrency, shared concurrency and weak memory, where you're at the um, lower levels, you think about a very shared inter model, whereas you go up levels of abstraction and think quite separately or disjointly. Now, um, with um, your work, you've got these various forms of contextuality, can you think at different levels of abstraction and think about different forms of contextuality and get more separate as you go up the abstraction? Or does that not make sense? Um, well, it's, a, it's an interesting question that I, I would need to uh, think about it. I think, yeah, I think the... Um, 
Yeah, there, there needs to be, I mean, the, the idea of mapping between different systems of this kind has been actually a bit, little bit less developed than it should have been till now, and it needs to be developed a bit more, and maybe that's the context in which one could answer. So I don't have a, I don't have a ready answer, but thanks for the, yes, I would like to think about that. Dangika, University of Birmingham. Is, is there uh, something to be said? Is there some kind of a tension or, or a reconciliation through contextual semantics between uh, uh, composition analysis, local analysis, global analysis? It, it seems to be somewhere in between, between a, a global analysis of a system and a local or a compositional analysis of a system. Yes. Um, so, in fact, the sort of, although I didn't really... Um, use those words, but I mean this kind of sheaf theory language is all about the passage from local to global. I, I, I could have made the talk much worse, Jeff, believe me. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and so then you're, you're I mean, so these obstructions, are, you know, not being able to glue things together is all about, you know, obstructing this passage from local to global. And I think actually there could very well be ways of applying these kind of ideas even in various kinds of program analysis and so on. So there are some, I mean, there's been some success in using uh, some of the tools related to uh, sheaf theory, some of the topological invariants in identifying contextuality. And nowadays with uh, sort of uh, work in things like persistent homology and so on, it doesn't seem so curious that one could use those kind of tools to, um, to do something uh, in the program analysis field. I think that's, that's kind of what you were asking. Yeah, so. While you're thinking of questions, I would hasten to add that my comments were, in essence, attempting to be a compliment. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that, 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 that you share with Feynman the ability to explain complex ideas using simple diagrams. <laughs> Thank you. Two cars. <laughs> and while, again, while the audience are thinking of a question, I would like to you to speculate a little bit further where you think this work is taking you. What, what do you think that... Mm. Uh, that your work on uh, this contextual semantics will enable us to do, what will, and it will lead to understanding that will perhaps enable the application of uh, information systems in perhaps a, a larger context or to deeper problems. Well, it's a it's a it's a good uh, it's a good question. Uh, a lot, uh, at the moment, a lot of this work is is at a quite a foundational level. Um, it can take time for these kind of, this kind of thing to, to sort of work its way through into more, um, uh, into things closer to applications. I mean, I was interested to see in this meeting for Prakash that I was mentioning, some of this work on duality is actually quite close to some quite practical work on probabilistic <coughs> model checking uh, in, in the work of Kim Larson and his group, for example. So that would be an example where it takes quite a long time, but uh, it does uh, work its way through. Certainly in, in the quantum information world, understanding multipartite entanglement uh, is, has proved very resistant. And I think, I do feel that we're, 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 we now have some of the tools for making progress in that. Um, and another thing which people are certainly interested in is... Um, going beyond this kind of basic non-locality type of situation, what's often called a bell-type scenario with a sort of Alice and Bob, to more general contextual settings where you have um, uh, which... Uh, and, and the question is, we've learned how to exploit two-party non-locality as a resource. Can we actually develop a much richer set of tools that will let us exploit other forms of contextuality as a resource in the same way. And I think we're making some progress towards that. We certainly know how to um, uh, apply bell inequalities to those situations and that kind of thing, because we have a very general way of doing that. And that's one of the key tools that one needs in seeing that there's some quantum advantage from using a quantum resource. I mean, that's the thing that one's always looking for. Classical computation is actually pretty good the difficult thing is finding those places where there's a quantum advantage. And there's still only a very few algorithms where there is a, um, a presumed quantum advantage. Uh, so um, that's Thank the you. lines. Thank you. There's a question here. Alessio Rumusho, Imperial College. So <clears throat> you mentioned, um, you hinted at uh, 
contextual semantics providing a, perhaps a better semantics for natural language than what we have at the moment, or rather than traditional ones. Of course, our, our brains interpret natural language. Should we deduce that our brains are contextual engines, so to speak? Well, uh, we are good at uh, using contextual information. Um, that's clear. I mean, the donkey sentences are a perfect illustration of that. There's actually um, a nice, um, I was mentioning donkey sentences, there's actually a beautiful paper by Albert Visser called The Donkey and the Monoid, um, in which the idea is that the speaker has a state which is being acted on by the utterances of you know, the other speaker in a, in a dialogue, for example. And, and so it's kind of modifying the context in a very sort of programming-like way. Um, I, I, yes, I mean, I think at, at sort of levels, at sort of me meaning levels that are actually going on in cognitive processes are highly contextual. Um, and indeed, in general, it would be very hard to put them all together. I mean, who, who, could, who could say that they could assemble all their different views and opinions into a single, you know, in the language of databases, universal relation? Or, you know, I mean, uh, it's actually, we have... Um, uh, different cases where different, um, different things are meaningful together, but not everything can be considered at the same time. So I think, um, so I think uh, actually I would expect to see um, a lot of contextual phenomena in, in these kind of cognitive and linguistic settings. Um, do you agree, <laughs> since, you, since you asked the question? Okay. Thank you. Achim Jung, the University of Birmingham. Samson, you ended your talk on a philosophical note about the relationship between computer science and the other sciences, or even beyond the sciences. I wonder whether you want to like, whether you would like to draw any conclusions for the teaching of computer science and the sciences from those uh, that's, remarks. Uh, that's a good, well, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a, that's a, well, it's a tricky one. I mean, one thing I would say is this. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a sort of challenge to teaching in a way, but uh, I mean, one thing I've learned is that um, the sort of view of when I entered the field of computer science of what kind of mathematics might conceivably be relevant or useful in computer science was really, it looked very small. And it's just been getting bigger and bigger. I mean, nowadays, you know, would you say a, um, a computer science student can afford not to know about probability? Almost certainly not. Um, I think of the whole world of machine learning and all of that, uh, continuous mathematics, and, and let alone horrible things like, uh, well, I mean, okay, I won't talk about category <laughs> theory and so on. So, um, and of course, that creates a problem. I mean, that, what, what do you put in the curriculum and how do you, how do you solve that problem? And I, I don't know, but, um, uh, but I certainly what one of the, positive things um, of what we've seen, at, admittedly, at the sort of research student level in the, in the quantum group is students coming from all these different backgrounds and learning fairly quickly a sort of common language and being able to move fairly seamlessly between these various disciplines. And maybe that's something we have to somehow um, aspire to um, in our teaching in general. I'm not saying it's easy to do, but that, that's how it seems to me the way that things are. Thank you, Samson. I'm tempted to ask you uh, if you could back in 20 years' time what you'd be talking about, but that might be optimistic on a number of levels. <laughs> Very true. So I'd now like to ask uh, Professor Adam Brattenberg of New York University to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Jeff. It's a great honor, privilege, and pleasure to have been asked to give the vote of thanks this evening at this wonderful event. Let me make one mathematical point in opening. It's uh, from uh, the area of lexicographic orderings. And in votes of thanks, it is undoubtedly the case that length precedes quality in that ordering. So while a short and excellent vote of thanks is to be admired, there is no doubt that a short and bad vote of thanks is much preferable to a long and good vote of thanks. <laughs> I assure you my vote of thanks will be short. I will leave you to judge the quality. <laughs> Samson is a co-author, a close 
friend and a very important person in my life. But since a little humor is appropriate at this stage of the proceedings, and Samson should never be taken too, too seriously, let me say that he is most certainly not the most important person in my life. <laughs> that is my daughter, my 12-year-old daughter, who I hope at this moment is hard at work at school in New York and not here with us. She's not here with us this evening. Uh, you may not be able to tell from my accent, which has been variously described as indefinable, uh, uh, and that by a computer scientist. I think the word has considerable technical content. Uh, I prefer to call it global 21st century. Uh, I, I, I am an English. I grew up in England. I almost became an undergraduate in Imperial, but I made one of the many mistakes I've made in my life and went to uh, a place somewhere out in the Fens where perhaps I traded precision for thinking too big, but that's another topic. In any case, I like to read some of the great British literature with my daughter. We recently were reading The Moonstone, Wilkie Collins, 1868. And we came across this wonderful line uh, for the experts in the audience, for the aficionados, uh, uh, by Gabriel Betteredge, who was the narrator of the first part of this multi-narrator superb novel, The Moonstone. And Gabriel says, I arose the next morning with the objective subjective and the subjective objective inextricably entangled together in my mind. <laughs> now, although the moonstone is a, a, a mood-altering and mood-altered piece of art, uh, you will recall that laudanum, that is opium, I hope I'm allowed to mention that in, a, in an educational setting, um, <laughs> played a central role in the novel, and perhaps uh, in, in the uh, writing of the novel, too. Um, uh, and mind-bending as all of that is, I can assure you there is no mention of quantum mechanics in the Moonstone. However, I can think of no better way to sum up this evening's talk by saying that tomorrow morning, I believe all of us will rise with the objective subjective and the subjective objective inextricably, you get the idea, entangled in our minds, but entangled in the most wonderful and educational manner. Samson, you're an intellectual colossus. You stand astride disciplines and fields, and you see more than almost anybody else. You see it, you write it down, and even more, you then communicate it in such an effective and educational form. Thank you for that. I think my remaining task is only to thank Imperial College and the BCS Academy for their hospitality, their organizational acumen, and of course, to thank the society for its excellent judgment in choosing Samson as an awardee. Thank you for this privilege once more. And I will end my short vote of thanks with one more congratulations to Samson. Congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, that brings the, uh, the lecture to a close. But before doing so, I'd just like to say that it's a tradition that we announce that the, the next lecture, the 2014 winner, uh, Steve, Professor Steve Ferber from the University of Manchester, will give the 2014 Lovelace Lecture and is the winner of the 2014 medal. Thank you for that. Thank you again, and thanks, Samson, very much for an inspirational talk.